So today I'm going to be talking. <coughs> excuse me. Today I'm going to be talking about inattention in adults assessment and treatment. Um, and uh, the question is, why is this important? Um, uh, although I do a, I have a problem in adolescent psychiatrists as well as an adult psychiatrist, and in my practice I see a lot of people who present with uh, symptoms of inattention. I assume that, that this is often something that's presented to primary care physicians. Um, and so it's, it's important to know how to address the evaluation of the detention as well as to formulate treatment plans that are tailored to the evaluation. Uh, so adults present to the primary <coughs> care physicians often with complaints of inattention. Uh, and they're seeking some help with that, whether they're doing poorly at work, having difficulty at home, or a combination of the two. Um, and in this day and age now, with the internet, commercials, and so forth, we have a lot of patients who come to the doctor, and not only do they say they have inattention, but they may say, I have ADHD, even though it's never been diagnosed. And they're basically coming in saying, this is what I have and I want you to provide the treatment for me. Um, so it's important to be able to know that inattention does not equal ADHD. And it's important to know how to approach this with the patient in order to do an adequate evaluation, provide education to them and have appropriate treatment. Uh, third reason for why this is important is that the first line treatment for most people with ADHD are stimulant medications. And as we know, stimulant medications can be abused. Um, the, you have the amphetamine class and the methylphenidate class that uh, people can abuse these. They can be, di there are people that may divert these medications and give them or sell them to other people. So it's important to know that, you're, that uh, whether somebody has a substance use disorder uh, in the context of evaluating them for the possibility of ADHD. So what, I would, what I'd like to tailor this talk today is to give you a couple of cases to give you a little bit of the flavor of what the uh, range of patients that you might see coming in and how the approach may be different for each one. Case one, we have a 34-year-old female with complaints of inattention that's having a significant impact on her work. It's happened for a few months, which is important to know, in the context of more demands being placed on her at work. She, she dislikes her job, but in addition to the inattention, upon further questioning, she's starting to report uh, depression, anxiety, insomnia, decreased appetite, decreased enjoyment in activities, and decreased motivation to accomplish the tasks, her day-to-day -day tasks. And she's requesting medications specifically to help her focus at work. And I'm gonna be coming back to these at the end of the talk today. Case two presents a very contrasting picture. You have a 40-year-old man who presents with a chief complaint of inattention. He's been as inattentive as long as he can remember. As a child, he struggled with inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. He got into trouble in class for not paying attention and for disturbing other students. However, he never received further evaluation or treatment, and he was never diagnosed with ADHD. Despite his difficulties, he graduated from college and is now employed. However, he's been consistently behind in performing his work and he is very disorganized. Additionally, his wife states that he does not listen to her or follow through on things that he says he's going to do. So this is impacting more than one area of his life. So what is attention? Well, it's important to focus that there's, um, and this is somewhat my definition here, but it's, it's being able to focus on what's important and but just as important as that, it's being able to filter out what's not important. There are numerous distractions going on at any one time, and if we focused on everything that was going on around us, we could never be focused. You may not be focusing on, the, when you're focusing on something, 
you're screening out what the temperature of the room is, uh, the pressure of your shoes against your feet, uh, the lights in the room, any sounds that you might hear, any other things that might be going on in your mind. You're filtering out what is less important at the time in order to focus on what is important. And so it's, it's, it's uh, both of those are needed in order to have uh, good sustained attention. Um, as I alluded to when we had, uh, when I started the lecture, inattention is not a diagnosis. And this is important because as I stated before, the, that one has a lot of people coming in and people will come in and they will have done some of their research or they maybe have looked on the internet or talked to their friends and they come in and they think that inattention means that they have ADHD. And it, it's important as a first step to recognize that inattention is a symptom. Inattention is not a diagnosis. And inattention has multiple etiologies. And it's important to start with that you have, okay, I understand that you have inattention. Let's take it from there and let's start looking, you know, getting a better understanding of what's going on so we can better arrive at the correct <coughs> diagnosis and treatment plan. What are the causes of inattention? I separated this out into two broad areas. <coughs> Uh, what I would start with is that uh, the causes that affect all of us uh, on a day-to-day -day basis versus what can be uh, medical or psychiatric diagnoses or something that may be particular to a specific person. And I'll go through each of these. So what can cause, uh, what can affect the attention in all of us? And there are, are different times where we may, may be more attentive, and there are other times where we may be less attentive. And it's dependent on numerous factors. First of all, there is a variety between all of us in our ability to attend. And I would say, for instance, in medical school, there may be uh, some people in the first years of medical school that can sit down and they can study for four hours at a stretch, being completely absorbed in the material, and be able to accomplish a great deal during that time without a break. There are others of us that may need to study for 15 to 20 minutes at a time, and may need to walk around, get a drink of water, and you know, have something, have a coffee, something along that line. So we find that between people, and this is, the way it is with numerous psychiatric diagnoses, there's a generic ability that we have to attend that some people are much better at it, at it than others. What is the, then I go into what are some of the factors that influence our ability to attend on a day-to-day -day basis? For instance, how well did we sleep last night? Uh, if you got adequate sleep, and you slept well through the night, you're obviously going to be able to be able to attend better to what's going on than if you didn't sleep well or you only slept for a couple of hours. Um, blood sugar, if you ate a big meal for lunch and you started getting an insulin surge and your blood sugar is dropping, obviously, then, and you start becoming tired, uh, obviously your ability to attend at that time is going to be decreased as well. Uh, the, what medications you may be taking. There are many medications that, although there are some medications, such as the stimulant medications that help one's attention, there are many medications that may have a side effect of making one tired or making one less attentive. So it's important to look at those factors. Motivation. Motivation plays a big role in attention. Um, and I, I find this in uh, my practice in terms of working with children all the time, that if they're interested in what's going on, they're gonna be much more likely 
they will much more likely be able to attend to what's going on. If they find, and as an adult, if you find the topic interesting, or if you find the topic pertinent to what to your life or your practice in this case, then you are going to be much more likely to attend to um, the material than if it didn't apply to you. Um, again, uh, another factor that can affect all of us from time to time is illness. If one has a cold, let's say one has the flu, uh, or one has you know, even minor, more minor things such as a headache, that is going to affect one's ability to attend to what's going on because you're going to be, you're going to have more difficulty in attention and you're going to be more distracted about what's going on with you physically. <clears throat> so inattention, um, the other uh, part that I would say is uh, just looking at distractions. Uh, and I separate the distractions into internal distractions and external distractions. So I'll go down to the bottom one first, which I've alluded to, which is the external uh, distraction, is what's going on around us. Uh, one uh, may be able to, uh, for some people, they need to be in a very, for instance, with studying, they need to be in a very quiet place no music going on, no sounds going on, no distractions whatsoever. Other people have more of an ability to filter out distractions going on around them. So for, there is an inherent difference in our ability to focus out the unimportant um, things that are going on around us. But obviously, if there are major distractions going on, then, then it's going then it can, affect our attention to what's going on. So if the room was excessively hot, if there was uh, cranes that were doing construction next door, if uh, everybody around you was talking, these would be the type of things that would distract us and would be make, make us less attentive to what is going on. But in addition to the external distractions, it's important to notice, to note when you're talking uh, when you're talking or evaluating someone is to, to note whether there's internal distractions going on. And this can be affected by many things. It can be affected by what's going on in one's life. If one has stressful things going on, what, need, what somebody needs to accomplish later in the day. Um, many uh, psychiatric conditions are going to present with internal distractions that are going to affect our ability to attend as well. <coughs> If one is uh, depressed or worried uh, or having obsessive thoughts, that those things are going to be presenting with internal distractions that are going to make it that much more difficult to attend to what is going on around us. So I'd like to move into <coughs> attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is going to be a focus of uh, my talk today, and talk and go through what <clears throat> the presentation of ADHD as an adulthood um, and looking specifically at what the diagnostic criteria are to help us distinguish uh, the people um, that we have presenting to us that have ADHD and those who do not. Um, <clears throat> ADHD historically has been the purview of either child pediatricians or child psychiatrists. Um, or primary care physicians who are treating children. Obviously, it's much more diagnosed in childhood than it is in adulthood. Um, it's important to note that symptoms of ADHD start in childhood. So if you have somebody that's coming to you that's saying that they have significant ADHD symptoms and it, is not, it has only occurred for the past six months or so, for me, I would say that that would most likely roll out the diagnosis of ADHD. So it's important to get a history of the course of the ADHD. Now, what uh, many people thought was that ADHD, as someone grows up, that, that basically the ADHD goes away, and people are 
able to, they're able to do okay once they reach adulthood. What we now find is that there are a significant proportion of children who have ADHD that as they go into adulthood continue to have significant difficulty, particularly with, <coughs> excuse me, particularly with the inattention. Um, uh, and as we find that the part of ADHD, which is the hyperactivity and impulsivity, often declines as one um, uh, goes through adolescence and into adulthood, that the, the impulsivity and the hyperactivity decrease, but not always. So there are times that people present in their adulthood, a significant proportion of those with ADHD will have inattentive symptoms as an adult, and a not insignificant proportion of them will have some symptoms of the hyperactivity in impulsivity going into adulthood. <clears throat> Looking at the ADHD criteria, we use the DSM. Five, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, the DSM-5 came out a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, and what I'm going to focus today, given that this, this lecture is focusing on adults, I tailored the diagnostic criteria, teasing out a little bit, uh, focusing more on adults rather than children. Uh, the Diagnostic criteria for ADHD were initially written for children, and you can see some remnants of that in the, in the language of the diagnostic criteria themselves. So sometimes you need to adjust each of the criteria to see how that might apply to an adult with ADHD. So for the DSM-5, it is a persistent pattern of inattention or hyperactivity and impulsivity. I would say persistent, not that it occurs every so often, but it is occurring throughout somebody's life. Um, and it interferes with functioning or development. Uh, the development part would be more for, for childhood, but the functioning would be uh, very pertinent to adults. So in addition to the difficulty with attention, <coughs> and hyperactivity, impulsivity, it needs to affect one's life. If somebody is saying that they're having some problems with inattention, that they, you know, that they struggle a little bit more uh, maybe than others with it, but it's not having any impact on their life, according to the DSM-5 criteria, they would not meet, uh, they would not meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. <coughs> Going through the, uh, the DSM-5 then breaks down the ADHD criteria into the inattentive symptoms and the impulsivity and hyperactive symptoms. And for those treating adults, more of your focus um, is most of the time going to be on the inattentive symptoms. And that's what your patients are most likely going to be coming in uh, reporting complaints of. And there's several criteria for the inattentive part of ADHD. Um, and I'll go through each one of those. First is failing to keep attention to close detail. For a child, it would be making mistakes on their homework, uh, any kind of projects, having a lot of, you know, having a lot of careless mistakes. But as an adult, this can affect someone as well. They may be, for instance, having a lot of careless mistakes on written reports. They may be uh, adding up things wrong um, if they're in retail work. Uh, there can be numerous aspects where the detail is required in one's work, as well as at home, um, that the people can make, the things can look a little bit shoddy in terms of tasks that they're completing. Um, difficulty sustaining attention in tasks. For children, this would, again, go back to school for most of the time. Uh, for adults, often this will primarily impact uh, work, that 
They can be focused on something for very short periods of time, and then they might get distracted or going on to something else, um, and, it, and it often impacts their work. Um, not listening to when spoken to. Um, uh, this, this, when I read this, I was saying, you know, these words were often kind of uh, written primarily with uh, child psychiatrists and pediatricians in mind, uh, but this also applies to adults as well, that uh, their spouse or significant other or family members may talk to them and they're often not listening or paying attention. Um, and this will often impact what's going on with their work if, for instance, their boss or their colleagues are talking to them and they're not really listening to what they're saying to them. Um, not following through on instructions. Uh, if it's, uh, that would be, if it's oral instructions, that would closely tie into the previous area, which was not listening to when spoken to. Uh, but if they're, you know, even if they're written instructions, they may not follow through, they may be not having an attentive, and, you know, things get done part way, that, uh, and that everything is not done with, uh, of which is asked of them. Um, trouble organizing tasks. Now, for, for children, we'd be looking at any kind of projects that they're doing in school, Anything, when I'm, when I'm talking about organizing tasks, I'm talking about something that is not like a one-step thing. Like, can you get this for me? It's a task, but it's, it's more of a, a, I look at something that's multi-steps. So something, for instance, like if someone has a project to do at work, uh, or something need, somebody needs to do something at home that requires numerous steps. Uh, for instance, if you're, um, going to prepare a meal that you have to you have to get out the recipe you have to make sure that you've got all the ingredients you have to do the shopping you have to make sure that you time everything right that's that would be an example of something that would take multiple steps but there are many areas that would take multiple steps especially in work and uh, people with ADHD often struggle with this. Um, the next part is avoiding activities that require sustained attention. Um, and I find this with, uh, with, I'll start with children again. The children will often involve, will often avoid things such as reading, um, such as doing homework quietly, uh, anything where they would have to concentrate for a while, that they know themselves well enough that it's hard for them to do and they will avoid it. And this applies to adults as well. That if they, you know, there are a lot of adults with ADHD, for instance, that hate reading, that need to have something stimulating going on, that it's hard for them to sit down and really focus on something. And you'll find that they tend to avoid it. Uh, people, people with ADHD as adults will often uh, avoid, for instance, uh, areas of employment that would require uh, sustained attention. So uh, people with ADHD may be less likely, for instance, to be an accountant, where you've got to uh, sit down and, and look at numbers and calculate things, which and that requires a lot of sustained attention. So they may be focused on something that more, <clears throat> where there's more stimulation going on and where they have more short tasks because they're more geared to that with their abilities. Um, a, another criteria is being easily distracted. Um, as I've talked about before, that if, the, that if something is going on, which most of us might be able to filter out, um, they are often kind of you know, truck goes by, they can, they'll automatically be looking out the window. If something's going on, they're, they're, they may be uh, reaching for their iPhone more than, even more than uh, the typical adult is reaching for their iPhone. So, uh, and then another part, that, and this goes in, this goes closely with the, the following through on instructions or, or tasks, is being forgetful. And I would emphasize, that the forgetfulness in ADHD 
is not a difficulty with their memory per se. It is a difficulty with their attention and their registering of the memory. Um, and if they, have, if they have sufficient attention that's going on, they can lay down the memories. It's not that they have difficulty with, the, uh, with short term memory kind of going out like, as opposed to somebody with dementia. It's the, the person with the ADHD is not really laying down that memory all that well to, to begin with. Um, and I would give, as an example that, that, that uh, applies to me, for instance, and I, and I suppose applies to a lot of you, is you're introduced to somebody new and, and they say, this is, and they give a name. And there's a, many of us, and me included, that when I hear that name, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Um, and unless you have, unless you're really focused on in getting that name down and getting that memory laid down, you're not going to remember it. Uh, the other part of the second area of the ADHD that we look at is hyperactivity and impulsivity. Now, as I stated before, this applies more to, uh, this will often apply more to children and adolescents but it can apply to adults as well. Um, the criteria, um, as I stated before, in terms of how these were written, at least first with mostly children in mind, a lot of these criteria seem to apply more to kids, but if you look at each of them, they can apply to adults as well. So for instance, often fidgety. You'll see kids, I will see kids come in, and I can just look at them. And within a couple of seconds, they're moving all around. They're kind of, their hands are going underneath their, you know, underneath their thighs, and, and they're shifting back and forth. But I've seen adults come in and do the and do the same thing. That they have difficulty just sitting still, even when they're talking to you. Um, a part of that that is closely tied in is getting up out of one seat. Um, that may apply. That probably applies a little bit less as when people are kind of approaching adulthood, but there are some people that are saying, you know, I just cannot stay seated for a long time. And again, they may, they may choose for themselves to go into professions or activities where they're not required to sit for a long time. So they can avoid that because it's so uncomfortable for them. They'll feel restless. They have uh, they have an inability to take part in leisure activities quietly. They'll often choose leisure activities that doesn't require them to sit down and uh, be still. They'll do things, you know, they may do rock climbing or very physical activities because it's, because it, it's geared more to where they have their strengths rather than what is difficult for them. They often feel like they're on the go. Uh, they may have things that they're going from one thing to another, uh, that they have difficulty <laughs> sticking with one thing for a while, or difficulty just staying, staying still, that they always have to have something that's going on. They may talk excessively. Um, this will apply particularly, it's much more pronounced when, it, when you see it in children, um, especially around their parents, that uh, they'll be, in, you know, that they'll, it's basically very difficult to get them to, to stop talking. Uh, for kids, you'll be hearing um, complaints from teachers, uh, but for an adult, you know, it, may, it may be good if like, there is a, another person there with them, or uh, you can ask them whether other people have commented, whether, they're, you know, whether they talk a lot or talk excessively, that those could be things that uh, are going on with them that could signify ADHD. Um, part of talking excessively is interrupting others. That um, in a conversation, that uh, they they may be talking, and then when they when the other person starts talking, it, it becomes difficult for them to wait their turn. So, um, which goes into the last <coughs> criteria, that when the other person starts talking, that you know they may jump in because it's so uncomfortable to stop and to try to focus and listen on to what the other person's doing um, because they have such a need to, to, to talk and to be active themselves. So although these criteria are often, you know, there is more of a focus uh, in terms of the writing of these criteria on children, 
that all of these criteria can apply to adulthood as well. So we have the, we have the inattentive symptoms, and then we have the hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms. Now, the uh, other criteria that are important to note is that the inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms need to be present before the age of 12. As I stated before, they're telling you that there's never been an issue with uh, inattention or hyperactivity impulsivity prior to, let's say, six months ago. That's probably not ADHD. Uh, ADHD is a lifelong disorder. Uh, the several symptoms are present in two or more settings. There are times such as that, um, uh, that, that it needs to be impacting more than one area of their life. If it's just in one setting, then, it, then it, I would start thinking about what is it about that setting. Now, this may not, now certainly it may play much more of an impact in one setting than another, but it should have some impact in other settings as well. Um, often people will say that the ADHD symptoms are most pertinent for work because that's where most of the demands are placed on them. But upon further questioning, you can find out that they're occurring in other areas as well. Um, there is a clear evidence that the symptoms interfere with or reduce the quality of social, school, or work functioning. As I stated before, if it's not affecting the, uh, how one's doing, there's, if there's no significant impact, then it wouldn't meet the diagnostic criteria. But for the most part, if somebody's coming in to you and they're complaining of it, then most likely it's having some impact. Um, and this last, uh, this last area is very important, and I will talk about this further on. The symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder uh, or happen during the course of schizophrenia or another psychotic disorder. The, uh, and getting back to the fact that inattention is a symptom and not a disorder. And that if somebody, and that there are numerous psychiatric conditions where uh, inattention is part of the symptoms that people present with. So for instance, if someone has depression, someone has anxiety, uh, someone has a psychotic disorder, obviously these are all going to impact one's ability to attend. And so it's important to see what else is going on psychiatrically with the person. ADHD subtypes. So uh, I will start with, uh, I'll start with uh, the second bullet point. The primarily inattentive symptoms uh, is that they present with sufficient symptoms of inattention, but not hyperactivity, uh, impulsivity, then they are predominantly inattentive. If they're presenting mostly with the hyperactive impulsive presentation, but not inattention, they're predominantly hyperactivity, they, then it would be categorized as predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation. I would say that's going to be less so for adults that would be something that would be more common that you would find with kids. Um, and then the combined presentation where they have, uh, they have enough symptoms of both the subsets of inattention and hyperactivity distractibility, then they would meet the criteria for combined type. What are some of the other areas in terms, uh, as I alluded to, in terms of uh, psychiatric uh, areas that may impact one's difficulty to attend. Mood disorders are probably one of the most common ones that uh, someone would present with. And this could be either depression or bipolar disorder. I won't go, go into a great detail about these. I know that uh, we're having another lecture, another lecture about mood disorders. But if, uh, for instance, if someone's having depression, they would be often present with difficulties with sleep, appetite, uh, energy level, concentration, uh, enjoyment of activities, depressed mood, 
They may have suicidal thoughts, crying. Um, so someone who is going through a major depression is almost always going to be impacted uh, by their ability to attend. And so if someone's coming to you and they're presenting with inattention and they're presenting with these other symptoms of depression, I would hold off on any diagnosis of ADHD. I would say at that point, my primary diagnosis is depression. Similarly, with bipolar disorder, someone's presenting in a manic state, some of the criteria of which are expansive mood, talking rapidly, uh, possibly psychotic symptoms such as delusions or hallucinations, uh, that, uh, that they're jumping from one topic to another, uh, that in this state, if someone's in a manic state, that just about always they're going to have significant impairment in their inattention. And if somebody presents to me with what I determine is a manic disorder, and that I would hold off on any diagnosis of ADHD. Going into the anxiety disorders, as I alluded to before, that these can have also a significant impact in one's ability to attend. You have generalized anxiety disorder, which means that someone over a period of time is worrying about all, kind, all kinds of things. It's difficulty to get the worries out of their head. They may have difficulty with sleeping, difficulty with the ability to attend, and because of the difficulty with the anxiety, that they are so distracted by what's going on inside their head in terms of their anxieties that they have difficulty attending to what they need to attend to. Uh, panic disorder, if one is having panic attacks, um, where, which are periods of time where they're having uh, significant anxiety, rapid heart rate, rapid breathing, uh, feeling like that they're going crazy or that they may be having a heart attack. But panic disorder is not just panic attacks, but it's worries about having future panic attacks. And if one has a panic disorder where they're having panic attacks, in between those times, they're having significant worries about what could, be treat, what could trigger a future panic attack. And that's obviously going to impact their ability to attend. Obsessive compulsive disorder, um, I would focus uh, in terms of, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is basically one who has significant obsess obsessive thoughts, or it's thoughts that they, the same, you know, certain thoughts that they can't get out of their head, or, and or compulsions, which are, uh, acts that they need to do in order to try to get those thoughts out of their head. Uh, obviously, if someone's having significant o what we call OCD symptoms, that those are going to impact one's ability to attend as well. Other disorders, uh, schizophrenia, obviously if someone is having psychotic symptoms, their ability to attend is going to be impaired. Uh, even those who have schizophrenia in between psychotic episodes may have difficulty with their attention symptoms, uh, as well as the uh, side effects of some of the medications may impair one's ability to attend. Uh, delirium from uh, any numerous medical causes, in addition to being disoriented, uh, attention is going to be a hallmark of difficulty. Uh, and dementia, in addition to one's difficulty with uh, memory, for instance, uh, or other symptoms of uh, dementia that one can have uh, difficulty with their attention, especially as it moves forward. So how does one go about the assessment? Um, I, and I'll address the various areas that I would look at. Um, one is the history of present illness. I look at the onset. Uh, the course. Um, so how the onset is when? When did it start? How long has it been going on? Is there a pattern to it? Is it occurring in more than one area of their life? Um, how do they cope with it? it does it have an impact on what's going on? And what's very important is to look at any type of associated symptoms that are going on. 
Uh, I'm looking at educational history. That is a very important part. If somebody is, even if an adult is coming in with reports of ADHD symptoms, the history is going to be looking at their past history, going back to childhood is going to be very important. One wants to look at educational history in two areas. You're going to want to look at academics and behavioral. Academics, I want to know how they did in school, how far they went into school. Was, uh, were they held back in any grades? What type of grades did they get? Did they receive any kind of special education services? Uh, and in terms of behavior, I want to know, were you, did you get into trouble a lot in school? Were people, uh, was the teacher calling your mom all the time? Uh, were you the kid in class that was always talking out of turn? Uh, that those, uh, those would be symptoms that those might support a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, I'd want to look at past psychiatric history. Somebody's coming in and they're reporting a history of if they're reporting difficulties with attention, and at the same time, they have told me that they've had a, a history significant for major depressive disorder in the past. I'm obviously going to focus much more on looking at other symptoms that they may have of major depression because that's going to be higher on my radar screen. Um, and this would be similar for any other types of psychiatric disorders that they may present with. I want to look at the past medical history, to look at whether they have any medical conditions that may be impacting their ability to attend. Uh, part of this as well is looking at their medication history and going uh, through current medications and looking through any current medications and the possible impact that it may have on attention. And as I mentioned before, this is a very important area, is substance abuse. That one needs to look at their, not only their current substance use, but their history of substance use. One looks at, and I go through each one of them, uh, starting with alcohol and working my way down, looking at their history of their use, the impact that it's had on their life, um, any type of legal troubles that they may have gotten into from it, whether it's had any impact in terms of areas of their life, and any type of treatment that they have had. Um, if one is presenting with significant concerns with substance use, that, um, that raises more of a red flag in terms of any kind of what type of treatment or further evaluation you would recommend for them. Um, the history, I'd be looking at, uh, so the symptom, of re the symptom review, I'd be looking at, looking further at their cognitive complaints, looking at other areas like how was their thinking, how was their memory, uh, focusing on the ADHD criteria, um, and, look, and whether there's any other issues that they're saying that they're having in terms of their thinking or cognition. Uh, I'd be asking whether they have any types of physical complaints that are going on that may be co-occurring with the difficulties that they are having. And I'd be looking at other symptoms, uh, such sleep and appetite, mood and anxiety, psychotic symptoms. Um, one area that I have seen at times that's important to look at is particularly with sleep that I have had uh, people come in, uh, and not just with ADHD, but they may be presenting with symptoms of depression and so forth, um, that when I start to really ask them questions, I find out that, for instance, they may uh, be sleeping, have a history of sleeping excessively and waking up tired, and when you start to ask uh, partners, for instance, they might say that they sound like a train during the night and that they're moving all over the bed. Um, so it's important, it's important to look at whether, for instance, they may have a sleep disorder or obstructive sleep apnea. Because if one's not getting adequate sleep, one's not going to be able to attend. ADHD screening in instruments, which I think that you have in your handouts. Um, uh, th this is uh, 
This is a good scale, the adult ADHD self-report scale. This may be uh, something that would be good to give out to your patients if they're reporting inattentive symptoms. It's a self-administered scale, addresses the major symptoms of ADHD, and can be scored in just a couple of minutes. So that can give you uh, an idea of whether you, they probably meet the criteria. But I would say that not just, I wouldn't just go by the score, I would use that as guidance for further questioning. But it is a good way to kind of get an overview of what symptoms that they are presenting with. Um, moving on to ADHD uh, medication treatment, uh, I basically break it down into two areas. You've got the stimulant medications and the non-stimulant medication. Um, for the stimulant medications, you've got two broad families. You've got the methylphenidate class and the amphetamine class. Um, for the short-acting ones, the, the most common one that we all know of is Ritalin, which is methylphenidate. There's also a uh, newer one, which is the uh, D-methylphenidate, uh, which is known as Focalin. Uh, we also have the long-acting medications, which include Concerta, Focalin XR, and Daytrana. Daytrana is, is a patch. I haven't seen it used so much with adults, uh, but sometimes it's very effective in, in, in use with kids. Uh, the amphetamine class uh, is short acting. You have dextra amphetamine or the mixed amphetamine salts, which is called Adderall. Longer acting, you have the Adderall XR or Bivance. Uh, Bivance, I'll take a moment to explain. Uh, it's uh, one of the longer acting medications. Um, one of the benefits of Vyvanse, the generic name for it is Lisdexamphetamine. Um, and Vyvanse, uh, in order to be absorbed into your system, needs to be broken down. Um, uh, and needs to have uh, the, uh, and needs to go through uh, breakdown in the GI tract. So in order for the, dex and the list part of the dexamphetamine is removed, and then you have the dexamphetamine. Uh, one of the benefits of this is that it cannot be taken by other routes. One cannot grind it up and snort it because it won't do anything. It has to go through your GI tract. So one of the benefits of the Vyvanse is that it cannot be abused in other ways. Um, there's been talks about the cardiovascular risk, especially uh, there's been talks with kids, but uh, adults as well. Um, the stimulants can uh, have some increase on blood pressure and heart rate, um, and that there have been reports of deaths um, with, uh, uh, most of the reports I've seen has been with, with children, but can apply to adults as well. What, to our current understanding right now is that most of these uh, are people with, who have underlying uh, cardiac issues. Uh, the recommendation is to, just to do a general screen for any kind of cardiac issues, asking whether there's any history of arrhythmias, any history of sudden deaths in the family, um, and whether they have any significant cardiac symptoms. If so, it certainly uh, would be advised to do an EKG and or a further cardiac assessment before again. Um, moving on, the, uh, non uh, and just a, uh, another part, the, the difference between, there are some people that respond more to one class of medications than another uh, in terms of the methylphenidate or the amphetamine class of uh, medications. The amphetamine class often has a little bit uh, more side effects. I, t I tend to start off with the methylphenidate class of medications. If you're looking at any of the medications within the class of the methylphenidate or amphetamine, there shouldn't be a difference in terms of its overall action. It's basically how the um, pharmacokinetics work. So basically how long, the, how long the medications work, when the peak activity works. So the differences between the medications in the class more differ in terms of how long and how quickly they act. Um, Non-stimulant medications may be a good choice for some people if you're concerned, for instance, with substance abuse, and one may move to this class of medications first. 
there's other people that do not like the effects of the stimulant medications. Mm -hmm. Some people feel that it affects their mood. Some people feel that it affects too much their sleep or their appetite. Um, and uh, so there are some people that moving towards these other medications may be appropriate. Uh, the major medications uh, would be bupropion or Wellbutrin, which is an antidepressant medication, also good with uh, smoking cessation, but also has been found to be beneficial for ADHD. You have adamoxetine, which is Stratera, um, which is uh, a medication that's geared specifically towards the treatment of ADHD. Uh, the good thing is that you don't, that you're not, it's not a stimulant medication. The downside is that it takes several weeks to know how well it works. Some people may feel a little bit tired on it, and uh, so you may have to switch the dosing to bedtime. Um, in Tunib, I've seen more so for children rather than adults. Uh, it's an extended uh, release form of guanfacine. Um, what I have found is it helps more with the hyperactivity and impulsivity rather than with the attention per se. Um, ADHD and substance abuse, of which I've talked about before, it's important to take a substance abuse history because there may be some patients that are coming in that are wanting stimulants to abuse and or divert to other people. Um, so it's important to look at substance abuse history. And, uh, some states, I know in, Mar in Maryland where I practice, uh, they're asking us to do uh, checks on our substance abuse. Uh, we have a database of uh, controlled substances that are prescribed within the state. Um, they are asking us to go in and to intermittently check this database to make sure that uh, our patients are not obtaining controlled substances from places that we do not know. Um, so that may be something that is required by your state. And even if it's not required, if that is accessible, it would be a good idea to check as a standard of practice. Um, the short-acting stimulants can be abused. If there is any concern about substance abuse or history of substance abuse, I would avoid this. And for the most part, I try to keep people on longer-acting stimulants um, that I find it better. Uh, there are some cases where people want short acting because they just need to have that, that help during short periods of time. But for the, most time, for the most part, people need help throughout the day. And I find that it's better to do the, short act, or the longer acting stimulants. Um, and with the longer acting stimulants, there's less chance of abuse. Um, when suspecting that someone is having substance abuse, I would refer them for further evaluation prior to uh, uh, looking at any kind of treatment. Um, ADHD, other treatment, you have with the core symptoms, uh, uh, you have psychotherapy to focus on the core symptoms. There are, AD, there are people out there who specialize in ADHD and work as ADHD coaches. Uh, there are numerous books out there that focus on uh, I think there's one called ADHD Friendly Ways to Organize Your Life. Uh, and so uh, people with ADHD can, uh, can benefit from help into how to work uh, in terms of organization and how to, how to cope with the difficulties that they have. An additional area of therapy that's important is looking at the impact that I have seen, for instance, numerous uh, couples that come in where uh, ADHD in one of the uh, one member of the couple can have a significant impact, for instance, on a relationship. And how does and how does one address that? Because ADHD doesn't affect just the person, but it affects everyone else that they're they're, they're coming into contact with. So going back to the cases. Case one, we have the 34-year-old female who presents with complaints of inattention, having, an in, having a significant impact on her work. Several months, there have been more demands placed on her, and she dislikes her job. However, she presents with <coughs> depression, anxiety, insomnia, decreased appetite, 
decreased enjoyment activities, and decreased motivation. She requests medication to help her focus at work. In this case, I would say that often people may come in and say, I just need help with this one symptom area. And upon further questioning, you find that they have a whole other set of symptoms that are, both, that are co-occurring with this. Now, if one kind of stepped in and said, okay, you have ADHD, I think you might have ADHD, I'm gonna give you a stimulant medication, that that's not going to, that's not going to take care of what she's most likely presenting with. In terms of the way, the way I put out the case, I would say that I would have a high suspicion for a major depressive disorder going on, and I would do further questioning about her psychiatric history, other history of you know, getting further information about her depressive symptoms. The other thing to, the, and this is the way that I approach it, which I think makes sense, if somebody's coming in and presenting, for instance, with a major depressive disorder, but state that they have significant problems with attention and they want you to prescribe a stimulant medication, and they say, well, even when I don't have major depression, I have problems with attention, my approach is, let's take care of the mood disorder first, and this applies to anxiety disorders or psychotic disorders, let's take care of that first, let's treat that, and then let's see what is left over. Because it's impossible to know how much inattentiveness one has at baseline if they're having an episode of major depression. So it's important to, so what in this case, if I found upon further evaluation that this person did have a major depression, obviously the first thing that I would treat is the major depression with a combination of psychotherapy and medications. Um, as a primary care provider, you may uh, start the antidepressant medications on them and refer them to, to a therapist um, as a first step. See how they're doing once they've responded to treatment. And then if they're coming in and they're continuing to report of just inattentive symptoms where everything else is better, then I might say, okay, we can relook at that. If they're coming back and reporting some inattentive symptoms along with continued, some continued depressive symptoms, that may lead me down the road of, well, maybe we have an inadequately treated depression still. Case two, we have a 40-year-old man who presents with a chief complaint of inattention, inattentive as long as he can remember. As a child, with questioning, you find out that he's had difficulties both academically and behaviorally in school. He got into trouble for disturbing other students. He never, however, he never received any diagnosis of ADHD. Now it's important to note that just because someone has never been diagnosed with ADHD as a child does not mean they didn't have it. Uh, there are a lot of people who, for whatever reasons, were never evaluated, and uh, they may have had it as a child and may continue to have symptoms of that as an adult. Uh, despite his difficulties, he graduated from college, is now employed, consistently behind in performing work tasks, and is very disorganized. His wife states that he's not listened to her or followed through on other things. I would add in this case presentation, when asking about significant symptoms of a mood disorder or anxiety disorder or psychotic disorder, that he's not presenting with any, any significant symptoms. I would also obviously be asking about any medication use, substance use, any type of, uh, or any type of medical issues. Uh, let's say in this case, for instance, that he was not presenting with such, that this would be, this would be more of a typical presentation that one may come in with, with somebody with ADHD. And so he may be somebody that would be appropriate for treatment with one of the medications for ADHD. So I'll move on to, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll move on to any type of uh, questions that anyone has.